G'day Skyfarers and welcome to the AOS Coach sneak peek into the 2023 Caradron Overlords Battle Tome. In this video, I will trade your Aether Gold for updated Allegiance abilities, enhancements, grand strategies, battle tactics, core battalions, war scroll changes and points. You'll also find the new rules for the Code Right unit. And as always, Games Workshop did send me this book in advance before store release. However, they will have no involvement in the creation of the video. You'll also find in this book art, narrative gems, and path to glory rules, but we won't cover that today. So grab your balloon, strap in, and let's embark. Starting at the Allegiance abilities, you have kept your six Sky Ports. You've kept Barak Nar, Barak Zilfin, Barak Zon, Barak Urbaz, Barak Mornar, and Barak Thring. Like the rest of the updated battle tomes, items like your artifacts, your command traits, even your carriage and code are no longer locked to your sub faction, and I'll talk more about those in a minute. I wasn't joking when I mentioned that I would trade you Aether Gold for this update, because Aether Gold is no longer in the faction's abilities, it's just straight gone. There's been some updates with how your flying transports work. The rules are no longer on the war scrolls, they have been modified, and there is a new transport vessels keyword added to the war scrolls. So let's break it all down a little bit and starting off with embarking. So during deployment, in setting up your Skyfarer's unit on the battlefield, you can say that it's embarking in a friendly transport vessel that is already on the battlefield. Now if you do so, you place that Skyfarer's unit to one side. In addition, in the movement phase, if a friendly Skyfarer unit finishes a move wholly within 3 inches of a friendly transport vessel, and both of those units are more than 3 inches from all enemies, you can say that the transport vessel is embarking the Skyfarer's unit. If you do so, remove that Skyfarer unit from the battlefield and place it to one side. Now it's worth calling out that the transport vessel can embark a Skyferry unit even if the transport vessel has moved in the same phase. Like always, the transport vessel has a limit on the number of models it can embark, and a transport vessel cannot embark a unit if it would exceed its limit. Now while a unit is embarked in a transport vessel, the following rules are going to apply. Embarked units are still treated as being on the battlefield, Range and visibility to and from models in an embarked unit are instead measured from the transport vessel. And in addition, for the purposes of determining visibility, the models that are embarked are treated as if they can fly. Embarked units are in cover, and in addition, you'll subtract one from hit rolls for attacks that target the embarked unit. Models in an embarked unit cannot contest objectives, Embarked units can't move, however when a transport vessel finishes any type of move, all units embarked in it are considered to have made the same move. Now you'll notice that it no longer talks about the marine units, so I'm not quite sure if there's a difference between marine and skyfarer options, but know that that's switched. Now you are wondering about the transport vessel's capacity, the ironclad can hold 22 skyfarers and the frigate can hold 12. And from what I can see, there are no limits when, for example, when you look at the old ironclad rules, if you had 16 or more models garrisoned in the ironclad, it wouldn't be able to fly high and you have the movement characteristic. In the updated version, those restrictions don't seem to be there. Now before you start thinking about loading up your boats with your balloon boys, I do want to warn you that Endron Riggers and the Sky Wardens no longer have the Hitchers rule. Now when you want to get off the boat and disembark, in your movement phase, if a friendly Skyfarer unit is embarked with a transport vessel that hasn't moved yet in that phase, you can say that the Skyfarer unit will disembark. If you do so, you set up the Skyfarer unit wholly within 3 inches of that transport vessel and more than 3 inches away from all enemy units. A unit that disembarks in this way can still move in the same phase. If a friendly transport vessel is destroyed, before removing it from play, roll a number of dice equal to the number of models embarked in it. For each roll of a 1, one embarked model is slain, and you can choose which model is slain. Then all units embarked in that transport vessel must immediately disembark before you remove that transport vessel from play. 
When a unit disembarks, if the model cannot be set up wholly within three inches of the transport vessel in which it embarked, and is more than three inches from all enemy units, it is slain. You still get access to the Caradron code, and now they aren't locked to your sub-factions. So you'll be free to pick one article, one amendment, and one footnote from the list below. Your article choices are Honor is Everything, Master the Skies, and Settle the Grudges. With Honor is Everything, when a friendly Caradron Overlords unit receives the Rally Command, you can return one slain model for a 4 plus instead of a 6. With Master the Skies, you get to add 2 to the movement characteristic of friendly sky vessels. With Settle the Grudges, after deployment but before the first battle round begins, you get to pick one enemy unit. You get to add one to the wound rolls for attacks made by friendly Caradron Overlords units that target that unit. My favourite article would be Settle the Grudges for that plus one to wound against that critical enemy unit that you want removed ASAP. With your amendments, you have Always Take What You Are Owed, Prosecute Wars With All Haste, and Trust To Your Guns. With Always Take What You Are Owed, at the start of your hero phase, pick one friendly Arcanaut Company unit. Until the start of your next hero phase, each model in this unit counts as two models instead of one for the purposes of contesting objectives. With Prosecute Wars with all haste, once per turn in your movement phase, when you make a run roll for a Caradron Overlords unit, you can roll 2d6 instead of the 1d6. And finally, trust to your guns once per turn in your shooting phase, you can re-roll one hit roll of one for attacks made by friendly Caradron Overlords units. My favourite amendment would be always take what you are owed. To make that one Arcanaut company count as two models when contesting objectives, which is always something that you've struggled with, although I could see you also going with trust to your guns. Finally, you have three footnotes. There is no reward without risk once per battle in your charge phase. You can attempt to charge with one friendly Caradron Overlords unit within 18 inches of an enemy, and if you do so, you get to roll 3d6 for that charge instead of 2d6. There's no trading with some people once per battle at the end of the enemy shooting phase. You can pick one friendly Skyfarer unit that was targeted by any shooting attacks in that phase, and that unit can immediately shoot. Finally, without our ships, we are naught. Once per battle, at the start of any phase, you can pick one friendly Sky Vessel unit. That unit can receive up to two commands in that phase instead of one. Of the three, my favourites would either be without our ships we are not, if you find yourself wanting to issue two commands in the same phase to a ship, or alternatively there's no reward without risk for that 3d6 charge. I want to warn you now that you might not like the next change, so brace yourself. You have three Iron Sky Command abilities that can be issued by friendly Arcanaut Admirals, or the Sky Vessels can issue these commands to themselves. Combat landing, when you use this command ability at the end of your movement phase, the unit that receives the command must be a friendly transport vessel. Any units embarked in that transport vessel can immediately disembark. A unit that disembarks in this way cannot move in the same turn. With fly high, you can use this command ability at the end of your movement phase, and the unit that receives the command must be a friendly sky vessels unit more than three inches from all enemy units. Now remove that unit from the battlefield and set it up anywhere on the battlefield more than nine inches from all enemy units and more than one inch from all terrain features. Finally, you've got disengage and you can use this command ability in your movement phase. The unit that receives the command must be a friendly sky vessels unit that has not yet moved in that phase. Now that unit and any units embarked in it can retreat and still shoot later in the turn. So these three abilities are now going to cost you a command point, where previously they were just free abilities on the war scroll. You'll also notice that you can no longer fly high out of combat, and you'll need to use a traditional retreat move that'll now stop you from shooting. But if you do want to shoot and retreat, you do have the disengage ability for that too. There are six command traits to choose from, as well as six artifacts, with a couple being locked to specific units. Looking at your six command traits, 
Grudge Bearer after deployment, but before the start of the first battle round, pick one enemy hero, and you get to double the damage inflicted by each successful attack made by the general's weapon that targets that hero. Cunning Fleet Master, at the end of the enemy's movement phase, you can pick one friendly sky vessel within 12 inches of the general and more than 12 inches from all enemy units. Now that sky vessel can make a normal move. A Scholar and an Arcanaut, you get to pick one additional footnote for your army, but you cannot choose the same footnote twice. Old Sky Dog lets you pick one additional Great Endron work for your army. X Grunstock lets friendly Grunstock units have the battle line battlefield role, and in addition, once per turn, this general can issue a command to a friendly Grunstock unit without a command point being spent. And finally, with Stormcaller, while this general is on the battlefield, you can re-roll any of the dice rolled when a friendly Aetheric Navigator reads the winds. Old Sky Dog might be my favourite command trait to get that extra great engine work, but that really depends if you're planning on taking two or more boats. Now alternatively, Stormcaller for the Reads of the Wind dice re-roll. Now it's worth calling out in advance that this rule has been updated from the current version, so this might not make a lot of sense if you immediately go look at the app. Know that the navigator has changed. Now to look at your six artifacts, the Master Rod Armor is for Arcanaut Admirals only, and that bearer is going to get a ward of 5+. Celestium Burst Grenade once per battle at the start of your shooting phase, you can pick one enemy unit within 12 inches of the bearer and roll a dice. On a 2+, ward rolls cannot be made for models in that unit in that phase. Blaze Beard and Sons Drac Hobbler Mag Bolas. At the start of your shooting phase, you can pick one enemy monster within 12 inches of the bearer and roll a dice. On a 2+, plus, that unit is grappled until the end of your opponent's next turn. Now, while an enemy unit is grappled, roll one fewer dice when making a charge roll for that unit to a minimum of one dice. Spell in the Bottle is for Aether Chemist only, and you get to pick one Endless Spell that does not belong to a faction. Now you can include that Endless Spell in your army without spending any points to do so, and in addition, once per battle in your hero phase, the bearer can automatically cast that spell to summon that Endless Spell, so you don't make a casting roll and it cannot be unbound. However, the bearer doesn't control that Endless Spell. Phosphoret Bomblets are for Endron Masters only, and once per battle in your shooting phase, you can pick one enemy unit within six inches of the bearer and roll a dice. On a two plus, that unit suffers one mortal wound, and then you can roll another dice. Keep rolling this way until the unit is destroyed, or you roll a one. Finally, the Voidstone Orb, and that's for Etheric Navigators only. Once per battle, when the bearer attempts to unbind a spell, you can say that it will use the Voidstone Orb. If you do so, the spell is automatically unbound, so do not make an unbinding roll. Spell in the Bottle will probably still remain a popular choice, but you will notice that is for universal endless spells like Purple Sun, Geminids, or Gnashing Jaws, for example, and not faction endless spells like the Skaven Lightning Vortex, uh, the Stormcast Comet, or the Beast of Chaos Bullfire Taurus, for example. The Voidstone Orb would probably be my next favorite artifact for that auto unbind, then possibly the Celestium Burst Grenade to shut down any ward saves once per game. There are also 13 Great Endron works for your boats, with 6 being for your Ironclads, 4 being for your Frigates, and 3 being for your Grunstock Gun Haulers. Looking at your Arcanaut Ironclads, the last word at the end of the enemy charge phase, you can pick one enemy unit that has finished a charge move in that phase within 3 inches of this unit. This unit can shoot at that enemy with its Great Sky Cannons, Great Sky Hook, or the Great Volley Cannon. Hexen Solutions Old Reliable Hull Plates, the first wound that would be allocated to this unit in each phase is negated. Breath of Morgrim, in your shooting phase, you can pick one enemy unit and roll one dice for each model in that unit within nine inches of this unit. For each five plus, that unit suffers one mortal wound. Zonbar Corpse Deal Breaker Battle Ram, 
After this unit finishes a charge move, you can pick one enemy unit within one inch of this unit and roll a number of dice equal to the charge roll, and for each four up, that enemy would suffer one mortal wound. Prudency shoots if this unit is destroyed, you do not have to roll a dice to see if the models embarked are going to be slain. In addition, if this unit is destroyed, embarked units do not have to be set up more than three inches from all enemy units. Finally, Magnificent Omniscope adds two inches to this unit's movement characteristic. Now of the choices, my favorite is probably the Hegson solution to keep my ironclad around a little longer. Next up is your Arcanaut Frigates, and they have four Endrin works, but the Prudency Shoots and the Magnificent Omniscopes are just repeated from the Ironclad, so I won't repeat them. Kazara Farewell, Scuttling, Failsafe. If this unit is destroyed before it's removed from play, and before any units embarked in it are disembarked, you get to roll a dice for each unit within three inches of this unit, and on a two plus, that unit is going to suffer D3 mortal wounds. The other one unique to the frigate is the Malefic Sky Mines, and once per battle at the start of the combat phase, you can pick one enemy unit that can fly, and that is within six inches of this unit and roll the dice. On a two to a three, that enemy suffers D3 mortal wounds, and on a four plus, that enemy unit suffers D6 mortal wounds. As I mentioned, Prudency Shoots and Magnificent Omniscope are the same as what's on the Ironclad. My favorite is probably the Magnificent Omniscope for that extra move, although if your meta has a lot of flying units, you might be tempted to go the Malefic Sky Mines. Finally, you have the Grunstock Gun Haulers, and there are three there. Ingrind Kaz Surge Injection Endrin MK4, when this unit makes a normal move or retreat, it can add D3 to that move. Now if you wish, you can also add 2D3 to the move instead of a D3, but if you do so and you roll a double, then this unit will suffer one mortal wound after the move has been made. Zombie Corpse Debt Settler Spa Torpedo. Once per battle after this unit finishes its first charge move, you can pick one enemy unit within one inch of this unit and roll a dice. On a 2+, plus, that enemy unit suffers a number of mortal wounds equal to that roll. And finally, the Cold Beard Collapsible Compartments. This unit gains the transport keyword, and up to six friendly Skyfairy units can be embarked in it. Of the three, my favorite is probably the Surge Injection Endrin for that extra move, and that'll help you sneak onto objectives, you know, move around the board a little bit. But if you are running a lot of Skyfarers, you might be tempted to make this a transport unit with the collapsible compartments. To customize your forces a little bit more, you have your six Skyport options. Barak Nar, at the start of your hero phase, you can roll a dice for each friendly Barak Nar hero on the battlefield, including any that are embarked, and on a 4 plus, you receive one extra command point. Barak Zilfin lets you pick one additional great engine work for your army. Barak Zon adds one to the hit rolls and the wound rolls for attacks made by melee weapons by friendly Skyfairy units that have made a charge move in the same turn. Barak Urbaz lets you pick one additional article for your army, but you can't pick the same article more than once. Barak Thring lets allied Duarden priests know the following prayer in addition to any of the ones that they know, and that is Rune of the Ancestral Guidance. It's a prayer that has an answer value of 3 and a range of 16. If answered, pick one friendly Arcanaut Company or Grunstock Thunderers unit that's wholly within range. Until the start of your next hero phase, unmodified hit rolls for attacks made by missile weapons by that unit cause a number of mortal wounds to the target, equal to the weapon's damage characteristic, and the attack sequence ends, so don't make a wound or a save roll. With Barak Mornar, you roll a dice each time an enemy model issues a command within 12 inches of a Barak Mornar unit. On a 5 plus, that command is not received. The command ability counts as if it was issued, and the command point that was spent to issue the command is lost. With some of the changes like fly high and disembark, you'll likely need a ton of command points, so Barak Nar I can see remaining quite popular. I dig the extra great Endrin work in a Barak Zilfin army, and you'll soon see that the frigate now has an interesting role to play in the army. 
Barrack 3 is also interesting to me if you're planning on bringing a Cities of Sigmar Priest or a Fire Slayers Priest because you'll get access to a ranged version of Curse. Finally, at an Allegiance level, you have Grand Strategies, Battle Tactics, as well as two new War Scroll Battalions. There are four Grand Strategies, and they are Rule Disguise, Defend the Flagship, Prospector Fleet, and Guided by the Code. With the removal of Aether Gold, it is no surprise to see the old Grand Strategy, uh, Spend Shares to Make Shares, that disappear. So looking at the four new Grand Strategies, uh, Rule the Skies is scored if there are one or more friendly Sky Vessels units on the battlefield, and there are no enemy behemoths that can fly on the battlefield. Defend the flagship, you can pick this grand strategy only if the model picked to be your general is an Arcanaut Admiral, and you score it if the general has not been slain and the sky vessel picked to be the flagship has not been destroyed. Prospect the fleet, after deployment, your opponent must pick one terrain feature to hold a bounty of mineral wealth and is scored if you control that terrain feature. Finally, Guided by the Code is scored if you complete at least four battle tactics, and each of those battle tactics is scored from the Caradron Overlord set that I'll show you in a second. If I'm picking a grand strategy from this list, it's likely to be Prospector Fleet. It seems like the most achievable from the four, and you've got the movement to support and protect that terrain piece. There are six battle tactics in Bombing Run, Mobilize the Fleet, Boots on the Ground, Opening Salvo, Blast them the Smithereens, and Stake a Claim. You might recognize Bombing Run, Mobilize the Fleet, and Boots on the Ground if you've already been playing KO. Bombing Run makes you pick one enemy unit. You complete this battle tactic if that unit is destroyed this turn using the Bomb Rack's ability of a friendly unit. Mobilize the fleet you can't pick in the first battle round, but when you do pick it, you pick three enemy units on the battlefield that are not embarked in sky vessels, and you complete the battle tactic at the end of the turn if those three units are all embarked in sky vessels. Boots on the ground, you pick three enemy units embarked in the sky vessels, and you complete the battle tactic at the end of the turn if those units are not embarked and are wholly within enemy territory. Opening Salvo, you can only pick this battle tactic if no units have been destroyed in the battle. You complete this battle tactic if an enemy unit is destroyed in your shooting phase this turn. Blast them the Smith Arenes, you pick one objective on the battlefield within 12 inches of an enemy unit. Now you complete the battle tactic if there are no enemy units within 12 inches of that objective at the end of the turn. With Staker Claim, you can only pick this battle tactic if you control fewer objectives than your opponent. You complete this tactic if you control more objectives than your opponent at the end of this turn. There are two faction core battalions for match play. Escort Wing requires you to have two Grunstock Gun Haulers and one Grunstock Thunderers unit. And there is an optional one Ironclad, one Frigate, one Gun Hauler and up to three Skywarden units and the benefit is going to be the Slayer, so you'll get that free once per game, all at attack, or unleash hell. The other battalion is the Attack Squadron, and that has a mandatory two Arcanaut Frigates and two Arcanaut Company units, with an optional one extra Arcanaut Frigate and one extra Arcanaut Company, with the benefits being Expert and Swift for two once per game command points, but they are set by the battalion. Kicking off the War Scroll update is the latest addition to KO, and that is the Code Write. With every article, every amendment, and every footnote of the Caradron Code learnt by heart, Code Writes are adept to not only citing obscure sections of the code that can expedite the completion of their air fleet's current objectives, but can also add clarifications on the fly. So for 90 points, you get a move 4, save a 3 plus, bravery 8, and 5 wound hero. It has one missile weapon profile and one melee weapon profile. The Aether Shot pistol is the missile attack with a range of 12, 2 attacks, hits on 3s, wounds on 3s, rend 1 for 1 damage. Now, if you get too close, you will be hit with a battle tome melee attack that has a range of 1 with 1 attack, hits on 3s, Wounds on 4s, no rend for D3 damage. 
For that type of damage, I imagine he's hitting you with a thick Stormcast Battle Tome. At the start of your hero phase, if this unit is within 6 inches of a friendly Caradron Overlord's hero, you get to roll 2 dice, and for each 4+, plus, you will receive 1 command point. It also has an ability called I Think You Will Find, and that will give you access to a new heroic action. Instead of using the ones like Heroic Leadership or Finest Hour, obviously your choice, it doesn't lock you out of them. So the heroic action you get access to is Search for Precedence, and you roll a dice. On a roll of a 1, nothing is going to happen. On a 2 to a 3, you can pick one new footnote to apply to your army until the end of the battle. And then on a 4+, plus, you can pick a new footnote and or a new amendment to apply to your army until the end of the battle. You cannot pick a footnote or amendment that you have previously picked for your army, and the new footnote or amendment will replace the current one that you have. The code right has the keywords Order, Carriage and Overlords, Duarden, Hero, Skyfarer, and Code Right. And for 90 points, this is a decent support hero that's going to help you generate additional command points. And if you're choosing those once per battle footnotes and amendments, it'll help you cycle through them. Now let's look at all the existing heroes and the key changes in their War Scrolls, starting with the Arcanaut Admiral. The Masterwork Volley Pistol Missile Weapon Profile has changed to be wounding on 3 plus instead of 4. You did lose if you want the job done, Protect the Admiral, Masters of the Sky and Aether Powered Munitions. You did gain the Admiral's Flagship, now if this unit is the General of the Carriage Overlord's Army, you can pick one Arcanaut Ironclad or an Arcanaut Frigate in this army to be its flagship. You need to record this information in your army roster. Once per turn, this unit can issue a command to its flagship without spending a command point. It gained the Grudge Breaker rounds, and once per battle at the start of your shooting phase, you can pick one friendly carriage and overlords unit that's not a sky vessel and is wholly within 12 inches of this unit. Now, until the end of that phase, improve the Ren characteristic of that unit's missile weapons by one, and the same unit cannot be picked to benefit from this ability more than once per turn. You gained another rule called Bring Every Gun to Bear, and you can use this command ability at the start of your shooting phase. The unit that receives the command must be a friendly sky vessel that is more than three inches from all enemy units that remained stationary in the preceding movement phase and did not receive the fly high command in the preceding movement phase. Now you get to add one to the attack characteristic of that unit's missile weapons until the end of that phase. But wait, there is more. You've also gained command the skies. Now you can use this command ability at the start of your movement phase. The unit that receives this command must be a friendly sky vessel that is more than three inches from all enemy units. Now that unit can re-roll run rolls in this phase. In addition, that unit can run and still shoot and or charge later in the turn. The Aether Chemist Aetheric Augmentation has changed. Now at the start of your shooting phase, if this unit is not embarked, you can pick one friendly Sky Fairy unit that is not embarked and is wholly within 12 inches of this unit. Now improve the Ren characteristic of this unit's missile weapons by one until the end of that phase. Atmospheric Isolation has also changed. It's a minor language tweak from Garrison to Embarked, but it still does give you the minus one to hit bubble within three inches. Drekki Flint's Captain of the Aceling has changed, and it has gained this extra piece of text that says, The unit you picked cannot also be picked to be the flagship. Let me drive and lightning fingers have changed. They are minor clarifications to when someone benefits. So again, embarked, not garrisoned for that re-roll to run and charges. Uh, and it also can't borrow artifacts when embarked. With the etheric navigator, read the winds has changed. And in your hero phase, you can say that one friendly unit with this ability will read the winds. If you do so, roll six dice and pick one of the following effects. Aether Storm for each roll of a one, you pick one different enemy unit within 30 inches of this unit and is visible to this unit. Now that enemy suffers D3 mortal wounds and you will roll separately for each unit. In addition, if any mortal wounds caused by this unit are allocated to the enemy unit and they're not negated, 
you will halve that unit's movement characteristic until the start of your next hero phase. Alternatively, you've got favorable conditions, and for each roll of a six, you pick one different friendly sky vessel unit within 30 inches and visible to this unit. Now that sky vessel can make a normal move of D3 plus three inches, and again, you roll separately for each sky vessel. You are more likely to do damage now and have the possibility of making more than one unit's movement halved, while the favorable conditions is completely new. Endron Master with Dirigible Suit. The Aether Cannons have changed to be range 18. They were 12 and they now match up with the weapon battery range. By Grungni, I have my eyes on you has changed and you add one to field repair rolls made by friendly Endron Rigger units while they're wholly within 12 inches of this unit. This was a command ability that let you re-roll the heal. You did lose Gaze of Grungni and you've lost the Hitcher rule. The Endron Master with Endron Harness's save is now a 3+, plus. it used to be 4. The Endron Master will heal 3 now, previously it was a D3. It too lost the Gaze of Grungni, the Endron Harness and the By Grungni, I have my eyes on you. But it has gained a rule called II Captain. At the start of your hero phase, if this unit is embarked and it has not yet used its Endron Master ability, you can say that this unit will attempt to crank up the power. Now if you do so, roll a dice. On a roll of a 1, the transport vessel in which this unit is embarked in will suffer D3 mortal wound and the Endron Master's ability cannot be used by this unit in this phase. But on a 2 plus, until the end of the turn, you can use the top row of the transport vessel's damage table, regardless of how many wounds it's suffered. The King of Mustache Mountain, Brock Grungson. There's been a couple of missile weapon changes in the Grungson boost that's now uh, attack 1. It used to be 2. It is D3 plus 3 damage. Uh, the Magnate Charter is 2 damage. It used to be 1. It did lose the Aether Blast. Uh, it also lost the custom-built dirigible suit. It also lost the Endron Harness, which was at 6s do D3 mortal wounds. It also lost the Hitcher Rule. First rule of Grungson has changed, and if this unit made a charge move in the same phase, add one to the attack characteristic of melee weapons used by friendly Barracknar Skyfarer units while they're wholly within 12 inches of this unit. Brock did gain the Warmaster keyword when it's in Barracknar, so it'll be treated as general even if it's not picked as general and can issue commands at a further distance. You have gained the Mustache Mounted Aether Blasters, each time this unit fights, after all of its attacks have been resolved, you can pick one enemy unit within three inches of this unit and roll a dice. On a two plus, that enemy unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. And finally, it gained Command the Fleet. Now you can use this command ability at the start of your movement phase. Up to three friendly sky vessels that are more than three inches from all enemy units can receive this command. In that phase, you can re-roll run rolls for the units that receive the command. In addition, the units that receive the command can run and still shoot and or charge later in the turn. Bjorg and Thundrix melee weapons have changed to be two attacks. It used to be three. It did gain the toxic gases ability and once per battle at the start of the combat phase, you can say that this unit will release toxic gases. If you do so, each enemy unit within six inches of this unit, roll a number of dice equal to the number of models in that unit that are within six inches of this unit. And for each five plus that enemy suffers one mortal wound. It also gained the Paymaster rule, and once per turn, this unit can issue a command to a friendly Gundrick Profiter's unit without a command point being spent. It did lose the Etheric Augmentation and the Atmospheric Isolation. Then looking at Bjorgen's homies, the Profiteers, uh, they have changed to be two wounds each. They used to only have one wound. Uh, various weapons were tweaked with the most impactful one, in my opinion, being the Volley Gun. It's now 2d6 attacks, and the Sky Pike has a flat 2 damage. Uh, it gained a rule called Protect the Boss. While this unit is wholly within 3 inches of Bjorg Thundrick, it has a ward of 4+. But it did lose the Thundric Profiteers rule, which used to give you a plus one to hit and a reroll battle shock if it was within nine inches of Jorgen. 
Looking at your Arcanaut company, there has been some various changes on the weapon profiles. Uh, for example, the volley gun is range 15 inches. It used to be 12. It's now doing 2d6 attacks where it used to be 6. Uh, the Skyhook is a range of 15. It used to be 18. Uh, it hits on a 4 and the Sky Pike now does flat 2 damage where it used to be d3. The Glory Seeker rules have changed, and while this unit is not embarked, you get to add one to hit rolls for attacks made by this unit that target a unit contesting an objective. Uh, that rule used to be a reroll battle shock and plus one to hit if it was within nine inches of an objective, and it gained the Light Sky Hook ability. Now, the damage characteristic of this unit's Light Sky Hook is a flat three if the target of the attack is a monster. Now there's been a boatload of changes with the Grunstock Thunderers. Their save has changed and it's now a 3+, plus. it used to be a 4+. Uh, there also was a bunch of weapon changes on their profiles. The Etheric Formigator uh, is a range of 12 inches, it used to be 9. Uh, it has 5 attacks, it used to be 3. The Choking Fog attacks made by the Etheric Formigator automatically hit. In addition, at the end of the combat phase, you can pick one enemy unit within three inches of the model in this unit that is armed with the Etheric Formigator. If you do so, roll a dice, and on a 2+, plus, that enemy suffers D3 mortal wounds. Uh, it's also probably worth noting that that attack no longer causes minus one to hit for units within three inches of it. The Grunstock Mortar has changed, its range is 18 now, it used to be 12, and the attack characteristic of the Grunstock Mortar is equal to the number of models in the target unit to a maximum attack characteristic of a 5. Uh, it's hitting on 3s, it used to be 4, but it is damage 1, it used to be damage D3. The unit champion has changed and the Aether shot rifle is just plus two attacks. It used to be a double barreled rifle, which was basically the same, it's just a language change. Uh, the drill bill deals one mortal wound on a five plus to one enemy unit after all the attacks have been resolved. The unit standard bearer has also changed. It's now plus one bravery. It used to let you re-roll your Battleshock tests. It did lose the drive them back ability. It also lost pin them, shred them, finish them. It's also gained a rule called suppressing fire. Each time this unit shoots, after all of the attacks have been resolved, if every model in this unit shot and targeted the same enemy unit, roll 2d6. Add to the roll the number of wounds caused by those attacks that were allocated to the enemy unit and weren't negated. If the score exceeds that enemy unit's bravery characteristic, it is suppressed until the start of your next hero phase. Subtract one from the hit rolls for attacks made by that unit that is suppressed, and the unit cannot be suppressed more than once at the same time. Next up is your boats, and your ironclad has gained two extra wounds, so it now has 20 wounds. The movement has changed, and it's tied to the damage table. Uh, it starts with a move of 10 when it's on 0 to 9 wounds. Uh, it has a move of 8 when it's on 10 to 12. 6 move on a 13 to 15 wounds, and then a movement of 4 on 16 plus. Some weapons have changed, like the cannon shrapnel, which is now a 12 inch range, it used to be 24. The cannon shell is a range of 24, it used to be 30. Uh, it also has two attacks, it used to only be one. It hits on a 4, it used to be a 3, and it does D3 plus 3 damage, it used to be flat 6 damage. The sky hooks have changed to be two attacks, it used to be one. Hits on a 4, it used to be 3, and D6 damage used to be flat 6. Previously, I spoke about the transport vessel changes, and I'll reiterate it here. Uh, the unit can fly as always. In addition, up to 22 Sky Ferry units can be embarked in the Ironclad. If this unit is a part of the army that is not Caradron Overlords, it can still use the Sky Fleet's battle trait. Uh, this used to be 25 Marine models, uh, so it's no longer Marine, and uh, as I've also shared earlier, it no longer has the restriction if you have 16 or more models on it, so it's just flat 22 Skyfarers. The Great Skyhook ability has changed. The damage characteristic of this unit's Great Skyhook is 6 if the target of the attack is a monster. 
Now, in addition, if the attack made by this unit's Great Skyhook scores a hit on a monster, if that monster is not slain after the attacks have been resolved, you get to roll a dice. Now, on a 4+, plus, that monster is going to be snagged until the end of the turn, and while a monster is snagged, it cannot carry out a monstrous rampage. A monster cannot be snagged more than once in the same turn. This used to be plus 2 to the charge rolls if it was armed with the Great Skyhook. The bomb racks have changed. After this unit finishes a normal move or a run, you can pick one enemy unit that this unit has passed across and roll a number of dice equal to the bomb rack's value. So against the damage table, it's 10, 8, 6, or 4. For each 4 plus, that enemy unit suffers one mortal wound, and this ability has no effect on units that can fly. It did lose the Aetheric Navigator and the Endron Rigger ability, but it did gain two rules. The first one being Bulwarks of Iron. This unit counts as five models for the purposes of contesting objectives. The other one being the Supremacy Mine, and once per battle, at the end of the enemy charge phase, you can say that this unit will drop its Supremacy Mine. If you do so, pick one enemy unit within three inches of this unit and roll a dice. On a 2+, plus, that enemy unit suffers a number of mortal wounds equal to the dice roll. It gained the Transport Vessel keyword too. Next up is your frigates, and there's been a couple of characteristic changes. It has a 3 plus save, it used to be a 4. It has a movement of 12. Uh, it was tied to the damage table. It's no longer tied to the damage table, it's a flat 12. And it has 15 wounds, so it gained one extra wound. Some of the weapons have changed. The Sky Cannon Shrapnel is a range of 12, has 5 attacks. The Cannon Shell is range 24 and has 2 attacks. It hits on a 4 as well and does D3 plus 2 damage. The Skyhook does 2 damage, uh, hits on a 4 and it has a 3 plus 2 wound. The damage table has changed as well and the levels are now 0 to 5, 6 to 9, 10 to 12 and 13 plus. Much like the Ironclad, it is a transport vessel and it's changed as well, so it too can fly and it can carry up to 12 Skyfarer models that can be embarked in it. And if this unit is a part of an army that's not Caradron Overlords, it also can use the Skyfleet's battle trait. The Bomb Racks and the Heavy Skyhooks have changed and they're exactly the same as the Ironclad, same as the Bulwarks of Iron. It did gain a new rule called the Assault Boat. Now after this unit finishes a charge move, you can pick one enemy unit within one inch of this unit and roll a number of dice equal to the ramming dice value showed on the table. So against the damage profile, it will be 8, 7, 6 or 5. For each 4 plus, that enemy unit suffers one mortal wound. Then you can pick any friendly units embark in this unit to disembark. Now, units that disembark in this way must be set up within three inches of the enemy unit and count as if they've made a charge move. In addition, in the following combat phase, the strike first effect applies to units that disembark in this way. Now, this is bloody cool. It also gained the transport vessel keyword. Next up is our Grunstock Gun Hauler, and the save characteristic has changed from a 4 to a 3 plus. Various weapons have changed, like the Cannon Shrapnel is now a range of 12 inches, it used to be 18. It has 4 attacks, it used to be D6. The Cannon Shells are 2 attacks, it used to be 1. Hits on a 4, uh, it does D3 plus 1 damage. The Drill Cannon is a range of 24. The Aether Shot Carbine uh, now wounds on 3s and does 2 damage. The Escort Vessel ruling has been clarified and it's now a 6-up ward for other Sky Vessels that are within 3 inches of a Grunstock Gun Hauler. And final change is the Bomb Racks and after this unit makes a normal move or a run, you can pick one enemy unit that this unit has passed across and roll 4 dice. For each 4 plus that enemy suffers one mortal wound and this ability has no effect on units that can fly. There's been various weapon changes to the engine riggers. The rivet gun now has rend minus two. The drill launcher has a range of 15. The volley gun has a range of 15 with 2d6 attacks and no rend. The grapnel launcher slash skyhook has a range of 15 and d3 damage. 
the saw has two attacks and as a three plus two wound. It did lose the engine craft ability, which was healing sky vessels, and it did lose the hitcher's rule. The grapnel launcher ability has changed, and while this unit includes any models armed with a grapnel launcher, once per battle at the end of your movement phase, you can say that this unit will reel itself towards an object. If you do so, pick a point on the battlefield within 15 inches of this unit and on a terrain feature. Then remove this unit from the battlefield and set it up again wholly within 3 inches of that point and more than 9 inches from all enemy units. The Skyhook ability has changed. The damage characteristic of this unit Skyhook is a 3 if the target of the attack is a monster. It also gained a new rule called Emergency Field Repairs. Now once per turn at the end of any phase, if this unit is more than 3 inches from all enemy units, you can say that this unit will carry out Emergency Field Repairs. If you do so, pick one friendly sky vessel within 3 inches and roll a dice for each model in this unit. Each of these rolls is called a Field Repair Roll. For each 4 or a 5, you will heal 1 wound allocated to that Sky Vessel, and for each 6 plus, you will heal 2 wounds instead. Next up is your Sky Wardens, and like the rest of the army, various weapons have changed. The Volley Gun range is 15, it also does 2d6 attacks with no rend. The Grapnel and the Sky Hooks both have a range of 15. Uh, D3 damage, it used to be 3. Uh, the Drill Launcher is a range of 15. The Vulcanizer Pistol is 12 inch range and does 3 attacks. The Sky Pike Melee Attack now has 3 attacks, hits on 3s and does 2 damage. The Grapnel Launcher and the Sky Hook abilities have changed and are, and are exactly the same as the Endron Riggers. And it gained an interesting rule called Time Charges. At the end of the combat phase, if this unit is within 3 inches of any enemy units, you can say that this unit will use its Time Charges to make an escape. Now if you do so, roll a dice. On a 2+, plus, you can pick one enemy unit within 3 inches of this unit, and they'll suffer D3 Mortal Wounds, and then this unit must make a retreat move. So there's lots of changes and it makes sense that the points have tweaked. So you've seen some points discounts on the Aether Chemist, it went down 10 points, while the Etheric Navigator and the Arcanaut Admiral both went down 15 points. Uh, there was also a bunch of points increases, the Arcanaut Frigate and Brock went up 60 points, Bjorgsen, Thunderic, Profiters and the Sky Wardens went up 30 the Arcanaut Company, the Ironclad, the uh, Drekki Flint, the Endron Master with Dirigible Suit, Endron Master with Endron Harness, the Endron Riggers, and the Grunstock Gun Haulers all went up 10 points, and the Grunstock Thunderers went up 5 points. As previously mentioned, the brand new unit, the Code Right, is 90 points and will take up a leader slot, and it isn't unique. So my initial read is that KO feels like it's gained a few more tricks in this update and it's going to spend more time maneuvering around the board rather than flying high, pointing and clicking at specific targets. You might not like some of the changes like fly high and disengaging using a command point, but it does feel like this is going to be a more interactive between you and I. All the units feel like they still play the roles that they've always played from the last book, so it's not like there's been a fundamental change, but there has been some new rules introduced. I like the rewritten Etheric Navigator rules to be able to read the winds. Uh, it seems like the Frigate has finally got a unique role in the battlefield compared to the Ironclads and the Gun Haulers. The Sky Warden ability to yeet out of combat I think is neat, as well as many other rules getting upgraded. Now I recognize there's also been a lot of long range weapon reductions, which would probably align better to the 3rd edition battle tables, but I guess you're not going to like things going from 30 to 24 or 18 to 12. I get it, right? But I guess what Games Workshop's trying to do is get you more into the middle of the board rather than sitting in the back, shooting up your opponent and then trying to win like that. I am a little bit disappointed not to see more melee support added to the army so you can compete in all the stages of the game. So I guess we're going to be in the gun line battles a little longer. 
I do like the frigates able to crash into combat, then troops are able to jump out within combat, and then even like the sky mines I mentioned earlier from the sky wardens being able to do their damage and then get out as long as they don't die. I guess I was a little surprised to see the Aether Gold being removed from the faction. I would have imagined it was very similar to how Fire Slayers have their once per game ruins. KO is such a niche army that I don't play either, so it's really hard for me to read what has changed and how impactful some of these changes are. Because on paper it does look like you've lost some things, you've gained some things. The rules have changed a little bit in regards to how they want you to use fly high versus how you're moving around the table. But I really want to see it on the tabletop and you know very quickly I'm going to get a uh, faction expert to come talk to me about how they're seeing the book. So this is really enough from me at this particular point. I do like some of the updates, don't get me wrong, but it is hard for me to read. But I'd appreciate if you left me in the comment section what you're thinking so far. Was there any War Scroll changes that you really like? Are there ones that you're now quite sad about and maybe they're, go they're going into retirement for a little bit? Uh, let me know in the comment section. I'm curious to hear from you and I hope you found this video valuable. Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. Now, if you did, I would love it if you pressed like on the video, as well as left me a comment with your thoughts. The conversation will continue over on Discord and the link is down below in the episode description. I also want to give a massive shout out to the AOS Coach patrons and YouTube members who are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you are all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a double one on a spellcast.